This is the 21.5 Show. You're on 121.5, the emergency frequency. Whether you're a professional pilot or want to be one, you're in the right place. Let's get started. Join professional aviators Dylan and Max as they talk their experience in the airlines, business aviation, and more. Life is good. Industry experts, unique stories, and plenty of fun. This is the 21.5 Show. Here we go. 2023, Max. I'm so excited to get rolling. We made it. We did it. Who would have thought? You made it especially. (laughs) At the end of 2022, it was a little dicey. Uh, We'll we'll talk about that later in the show. (laughs) But uh, welcome, folks, to 21.5 Show. It is the show for professional pilots by a couple of uh, professional pilots. There's me, Dylan. Hello. Representing in this corner, business aviation. And I'm Max, representing both business aviation and the airlines. I have an exciting news, Max. We need to add a third corner. Go ahead. A third chair, a third microphone to the 21.5 show. Folks, we'd like to introduce our new friend and producer and badass, Joel. Hi, Joel. Hi, guys. And that's correct on all accounts. Friend, producer, badass. So a couple months ago, you guys might have remembered, we put out a call for a producer. And we had a bunch of uh, listeners write in and people that sort of like us that were pilots that watched the show, maybe had a little bit of experience. And then we had this Joel fella write in and he's like, hey, I'm actually like in media, but I'm just into aviation too. And we're like, oh, maybe we hire somebody that actually knows what they're doing in this space because that's why we're hiring a producer in the first place because we're just kind of continuing to stumble through this sector that we don't know a ton about. So anyway, Joel came to the rescue and uh, he's going to be a great addition to the show. He sounds like a radio guy. This is the elephant in the room. This is the problem. Joel has a better radio voice than either of us. <laughs> Joel, you like went to school for this. You did some like broadcasting classes. Tell Correct. us a little bit about like how you developed that like on microphone persona. Give us a lesson here. Well, I started in radio. So okay. Classic terrestrial radio, AM, FM stuff. And one of my first mentors said, hey, because I didn't always have the sultry, wonderful oh, voice <laughs> unbelievable. of Joel right here. But uh, back in the day, yeah, it was a little squeaky, it was a little up there. And a uh, guy said, hey, you need to be smoking a pack of unfiltered cigarettes a day. Bring that bad boy down. And so uh, that's what I do. Um, <laughs> no, I don't do that. But so it's just over time you get there. You get a lot of old radio guys that are like, dude, you don't belong here. And then <laughs> over time, that con- constant emotional whipping, you know, brings you into a better voice. Have you listened to a lot of the Casey Kasem weekend dedications from back in the day? It's kind of, I get a twinge of that. Casey Kasem. Yeah. American number, Countdown. Number yeah. 32. <laughs> number, this comes from I remember Joel. listening to that. Do you think people really wrote in or did they just make it up? Probably 50-50. I don't know. So this is not where maybe you tuned into the 21.5 show today and you thought we were going to be... A good start. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, moving along. Uh, welcome to the show, Joel. Joel, tell us a little bit about yourself. And of course, tell us about your aviation connections too. We'd like to hear about that. Yeah. So a little bit about me. I'm from uh, the Midwest, actually, not from... Uh, where you guys are, so that broadens our horizons a little yes. bit. But have a little bit of a background in uh, communications on the day-to-day front. I'm in radio, print, digital, and uh, actually have a background in agricultural communication. Went to the Ohio State University. While there, I was also involved in the aviation program. I do not have my pilot's license, but man, I'd love to get it in 2023. Working yes. on that, guys. Yes. So you got to keep me at it. <laughs> but I don't have it, but I'm a great lover of aviation, so did things throughout college, like jumped into the opportunity to represent the uh, Center for Aviation Studies from Ohio State at Oshkosh, for instance. Great memories from there because that was the year Embry-Riddle was being punished for leaving slightly early the year before, and so Ohio State's airplane got out before Embry-Riddle. I didn't even hear this story. Wow. So Embry-Riddle's plane left Oshkosh early? Well, I think they just like left their booth space five minutes before like the show officially closed. And oh. so the next year they were, that's what we told ourselves. I don't know. You know, the Eagles were always pressing on. We're always looking for the next adventure. You got places to be. We just needed something in our little Ohio State booth looking down there at the giant. Yeah. And pretty riddle <laughs> section. <laughs> Listen, Anyways, but is... so from there, I've been state involved. I'm one of those guys that's the on and again and off again uh, student pilot. So I've got about like 20 hours under my belt. 
but I do not have that license. On the side, though, I do fly drones, licensed drone pilot. I hate calling myself that licensed drone operator. <laughs> Stand clear. We do that, do all kinds of things, but stay involved in uh, our agricultural operation here in the Great Buckeye State and uh, love looking towards the sky and listening about it as well. Hey, Joel, do you remember how you uh, linked aviation and agriculture in that one story about how aviation used to have a part in agriculture? Oh, yes. So uh, a former communications job of mine, I was a multimedia specialist for a, a large bull semen company. Some would say genetic technology. Let's just call it for what it is. All right. <laughs> genetic and, technology. Uh, some don't know this, but back in the day, there was a program that was started to drop genetic technology in packages by the air. And uh, so, yeah, there used to be some instances of airplanes flying across to dairies out in the middle of nowhere and dropping semen from the sky. Wow. Was it just like a fresh delivery? Is that why it had to be done by air? Immediately. Time sensitive? Is that what you're saying? I mean, something like that. They had the bull there <laughs> on the taxiway. All right. Uh, come on, <laughs> Ben. Oh, there he is. Okay, hurry. <laughs> Clear prop. And the guy runs Let's out go. with a jar. And yeah. puts, where's the parachute? <laughs> so they would drop it for a farmer to collect and then proceed with the genetic. Uh, yeah, there would just okay. be this warm. Well, frozen and liquid nitrogen. So oh, it was frozen? Good for all eternity. Wow. Yeah, until it's unfrozen, then it can be used in the cow. Why the urgency to drop it by air? I don't know. Just because it was cool. I think it was like freshly harvested. And you just... You just hope those packages are well tied, you know, or else, is it raining? Nope. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Sleeting. <laughs> Jim, why do you look like a glazed donut? <laughs> that was on our initial interview with Joel. So once yeah. we heard that story, we said we're hired. We don't need to hear anything else. We're good. Joel, I will now afford you 10 seconds to talk about the football game from a couple nights ago. No, nobody on, cares on New Year's about Eve. that. Go ahead. I don't want to talk about it. Okay. All right. Perfect. <laughs> Joel, do you have any interesting hobbies oh. you want to talk about? The one hobby that did not come up in the initial job interview, but I was found out upon, I am a, a semi-professional stone carver. <laughs> Why are you laughing, Joel? This is true. What's so funny about that? One of these hobbies is lighter than air. The other is fairly heavier. Yeah. So <laughs> That one we're excited about. I've actually enjoyed following your Instagram yeah, and checking out <laughs> some of your work. So at uh, we'll, we'll... Treasured Stoneworks, folks, while you're yeah. over there, follow the at 21.5. Yeah, check it out. Okay. Welcome to the team, Joel. Yes. Glad to have you. Joel's going to keep us posted on his aviation progress as well as doing a lot of the back end work for the show. And he'll be joining us with this silky radio voice. We can't put that to waste, Max. Mm -mm. I think he's got to read the emails to us and jump in every once in a while. So, of course. Joel, we like to collect reviews. Have we gotten any recently? All right, guys. Empty Kitchen says so informative. Love this show. Doesn't matter if you have zero hours or 10,000, you'll learn something new in each show. Yeah, you learned a lot here in the first 10 minutes of this show. <laughs> Incoming. <laughs> Thank you for the review, Empty Kitchen, and uh, shoot us an email, info at 215podcast.com, and uh, we'll be happy to send you some stickers. We also got a review from YouTube, which I, not written by my seven-year-old, which I'm very <laughs> excited about. Thanks, guys. Great podcast, says Fred on the How to Be a Contract Pilot video. Okay, and, and I put that in there because I wanted to talk about YouTube for a second. One of the things Joel's really helping us with is video. And so the YouTube channel is going to get a little spicier this year. So if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, we'll have a link in the show notes for yeah. that. Spoiler, it's, it's not just going to be video of Dylan and I talking into a microphone. No, it's, we've got... We, just so you know. Yeah, it'll be good. That is it for the reviews. On to the mailbag, which is of course brought to you by Advanced Air Crew Academy. Our friends at aircrewacademy.com are the authority in preparing education modules for business aviation. Does your flight department need to get smarter? Mine doesn't, but... Mm. Listen, <laughs> I think we could all get a little bit smarter. <laughs> Definitely need to learn about something new. Is there anything new you're excited about learning in uh, 2023, aviation-wise? Well, do you remember we had Advanced Air Crew Academy on? We talked about runway overruns. Yes. So just hours ago, I was holding short of runway 7 at Hawthorne, which gen I've never taken and landed off of 7 and been in there yeah. a lot of times. It's always to the west like LAX. And there's all these, these FA cars and trucks out there. And there's a bunch of people like staying right by the, the end of the runway where you're going to be taking off. And it's right. a short runway. So a lot of times you're going to do a static thrust, you know, run up and take off. And so I'm like, what are all these people? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. And I took a picture. I'll show you with half of the localizer antenna missing. 
where that Phenom 300 slid off the runway oh, through yeah. the antenna. And dude, like into the fence, it's not that much room there. Yes. And right, there's a road and then a huge brick building. Could have been worse. Wow. Could have been a lot worse. Yeah. So. I've been into that airport in the Challenger. That's, yeah. that's right there. It's kind of staggering to sit there and be at the scene of the crime from the video you just saw. Right. I mean, look at that picture. We'll post this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See the big missing part of the localizer mm. where the plane went through? Yeah, that's a problem. Anyway, if you want to avoid that type of a situation, go listen to the episode we had with Dan from Advanced Air Crew Academy where we talk about simple steps you can implement at your flight department to avoid runway overruns. All right, from the mailbag. I was reading a discussion where the author asked a question about past criminal charges and being able to apply for a commercial license. This had got me thinking, what are the rules? I couldn't find anything definitive and everyone else's responses were all over. So I thought this might make an interesting topic to touch on. Will. Okay. Well, we know that one of the requirements is the feds say to get your ATP, you have to be of good moral character. But I don't know what that really means. Yeah, that's very That's subject. like our, when we got our real estate license. Isn't there some type of... Well, wow, listen, thing. we've all been flying long enough. That was not strictly enforced. <laughs> yeah. We'll just yeah. say that. Just go into the pilot wives uh, group. <laughs> into the rants and raves yeah, group. You'll... We'll talk about that later. So I looked up what the FAA website says. It says you can get an FAA certificate if you have a felony conviction, unless the conviction is for a drug or alcohol related offense. In that case, you cannot apply for a certificate for up to one year after your final conviction, which doesn't seem that restrictive, to be honest with you. But I think really at the end of the day is, Getting a certificate from the FAA and getting a paying flying job are two different things, right? Yeah, that's true. And also other ramifications like having been denied entry into countries, namely Canada, we know right. is very tough on people if they've had a DUI and other stuff. So we would recommend talking to a career coach. Yeah. People like James and, and other folks deal with this a lot. I think that's where those people can be really valuable to help you do it. And maybe there's a certain segment of aviation that you can fit into that maybe would work, like you said, maybe flying into Canada. So flying for an airline might be a problem. Yeah, who knows? But maybe you can do some type of cargo or, or something else that doesn't require that. So I think it is certainly possible. It depends. All right, what's next, Joel? Hey, guys, that story about the botched Baja flight almost had me spitting out my coffee. In 2005, I had an eerily similar situation. I was green also. Lat long coordinates didn't bring us to an airport circled and landed at nearest airstrip a few miles away, cleared power lines and landed on a dirt strip that couldn't have been much longer than 2,000 feet. Military jeep shows up with soldiers and takes the captain away for two hours. I could go on and on about that day. So naive at the time. I would love to write something up if you wanted it for the show. Grant. Yeah, we probably need to hear that one. Yeah, Grant, shoot us an email. Let's set up a call. We'd yeah. love to hear that story. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. We replayed the story of uh, our buddy Sean landing in the uh, desert yeah. at the wrong airport recently and uh, back some good memories. We're going to talk a lot more about landing in Mexico here in the uh, coming episodes. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that will be something to look forward to. All right. What's next? Good afternoon, Max and Dylan. You read my podcast review on your last podcast, 145 Captain. Made me feel famous for a second. As far as the addictive personality, you're not wrong when it comes to ice cream. But so far, that's where it ends. I just hired Tim Pope to be my financial planner as a result of hearing him on your podcast. And when we met today on our Zoom call, I told him that review was mine and he started laughing. When I like something, I like something. What can I say? Anxiously awaiting for the third season of Ted Lasso. Ooh, aren't we all? <laughs> on a side note, I'd love to be a diamond dog or a resource if you ever have a need for additional. These are my qualifications. Currently a similar instructor, captain on EMB 145 for Piedmont. I fly once a month and teach in the simulators full time. I'm always learning and growing as a simulator instructor, but do feel that I have a solid level of experience, expertise in this area to offer advice and insight. Just thought I'd throw this out there. I remain a fan of your podcast and look forward to each one. Marie. Cool, Marie. Appreciate that. The uh, Diamond Dogs, we're always hiring for the Diamond Dogs. Low compensation, but high prestige. High prestige. Gentlemen, just listened to your podcast for a second time. First one was the spouse episode from February of 22. So I guess you had me at 121.5. You guys give great advice, insight in the industry, and add genuine humor. In other words, FOMO or buyer's remorse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking of joining the ranks of the airline industry after retiring from the military through a rotor transition program at a regional. In your podcast, you mentioned the pay increases were temporary, but everyone I've spoken to or read says it's permanent and that legacy or majors 
are making similar pay moves. Could you please clarify? Appreciate the help, Ryan. It's my understanding a lot of those regional pay increases were for like two years. And then I remember we said like they could be temporary. And then someone from Sky West wrote in and said, no, ours is permanent. Um, so I think you're going to have to read the fine print at whatever airline you're looking at. Yeah, it's it's just like anything else. It's a lot of uh, differences between each one. Everyone's contracted. Yeah. Next airline to the next. So yeah. you're going to have to look. But you're right. Pay increases are happening at the majors. Everyone's in contract negotiations right now we talked about delta's ta last time well there's a lot of talk of payer yeah. increases yeah that's true <laughs> hopefully as we like to say a lot's going on but nothing's happening <laughs> yet but good luck ryan i think the regionals we talked with james about the numbers of people that are leaving it just seems like it would be hard to imagine that the regionals cut the pay anytime soon all right final one hello really enjoy your podcast it makes my drive to and from work even better you ask relevant questions and let your guests answer them without interruption. Nice touch. I recently listened to the Roger Reeves interview on the Sean Ryan show, all five and a half hours, and I'm looking forward to hearing your episode with him. Roger is an American treasure in my honest opinion. Like hearing your career advice, much of it is relevant even for us low and slow helicopter pilots. Keep up the good work and keep your gauges in the green. Roll tide, Derek, and go Buckeyes. Ooh. I added that one. I was going to say, I know. This I is... can't say that <laughs> Cool. Derek, glad you've checked out Roger Reeves. And those episodes are going to be dropping here pretty soon. Next, right? Yeah, next. Yeah, the next episode is going to be part one of the Roger Reeves Look forward to episode. it. Episode, and those of you who don't know who Roger Reeves is yet, yeah, he's the most epic drug smuggling pilot of all time. Some of the craziest stories I've ever heard. Look forward to that. It's going to be a two-parter because we've got so many good yeah, stories from him. Very extensive. Well, that'll do it for the mailbag. If you want to get in touch with us, it's info at 215podcast.com. We'll be happy to read and potentially answer your email, although I can't guarantee it's going to and be useful. And if it's anonymous, you can always fill out the anonymous form on our website. Yeah, that's right. All right, Max. It's time for our 2023 inaugural installment of Flight Advice. Yeah, let's get after it. It's, of course, brought to you by our friends at Harvey Watt. We've got some flight advice for all professional pilots out there. Protect yourself. Hide your kids. Hide your wife. <laughs> Make sure if you're a pro, you're protecting against loss of medical certificate with our friends at Harvey Watt. Visit harveywatt.com to see all of the coverages that they provide for pros out there. All right. So for this flight advice, Joel, why don't you go ahead and uh, take it away? Hey, guys. Just got hired by a major airline. Excited to reach my final destination. But I know there are big changes ahead for the whole family. Some of the other guys in my new hire class were talking about online pilot wives, social media groups that offer support for spouses. Do either of your families have experience with these types of groups? And do you think they do more harm or good? Pick up and drop off. Well, pilot wives, social media is a very polarizing topic in my household yes. with my wife. Sometimes I'm like, this is such a waste of time and all of you getting and feeding off each other and this negativity. And it's just, and then sometimes I'm like, huh, no, that was actually useful and worthwhile. So that's the extent of my experience with social media pilot wife stuff. So we decided to invite my wife, who's very entrenched in the pilot social media scene, to be a diamond dog on this one. Oh. So, Mackenzie, welcome to the show again. Your second appearance. So I do consider myself an expert, so thank you. You said that how many pilot wife groups are you in, Ken's? Well, it's funny because when Max and I first started talking about this, I said, I think it's like four or five. And I went through yesterday. I'm a member of 14. Oh, my Ooh. God. Specifically? Specifically. Pilot? Mm -hmm. You have to keep in mind that there's different pilot wide groups for each sector. So there's like specific ones to business aviation, to the airlines. When you have a spouse who does all of the above, you get to join all of the above. There's local mm. group. There's like, you know. National groups. It is what it is. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this sounds like a there's trade association. A, there's a union family group. Yeah. When, oh, and when's your national convention? <laughs> it's tomorrow. <laughs> okay. So, Ken's, you've been a part of these groups for, I would say, years at this point, right? Yep. What do you think about our listeners' question? Is this helpful? Hurtful? What do you think? Both? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that some are very helpful and some are very hurtful. I think the ones that are like specific to your airlines or specific to where you live, you know, there's like a regional airline. I shouldn't say regional, 
but there's a Phoenix based group for airline and that's very helpful. So it talks specifically about like things that are going on. It talks about the emails that our pilots get and then lose that they should actually be keeping track of. It talks about like benefit information, stuff that the wives are more involved in than the husbands. But there is ones that are more broad, like pilot spouses and that's just like anybody can join i'm not sure there's a lot of regulation and oh. that is the t so i think i'm a looker not a toucher so i read it all and i absorb it all but i don't ever comment or post anything i think that's probably the only reason that max still lets me be a part of them but there is some good tea that I think could steer people in the wrong direction. So if you're like thinking about becoming a pilot wife or you're very new to the pilot situation, you can be steered in the wrong direction very quickly. Well, there's a lot of dirty stories on there about like, oh, my pilot and I just discovered in his text messages and he's been, you know, dating this flight attendant or like all there's tons of that like right. ugly, ugly side of in there. Yeah, it gets interesting because obviously people have different communication styles. So like someone will write, hey, my husband's on a three day and I haven't talked to him in three days. Does anybody think that's weird? And then you have like 400 comments and these women are like, he's totally cheating on you. Like, this is such a red flag. And then you have other women who are like, oh, I've been a pilot way for 40 years. I don't talk to my husband for eight days at a time. And it's fine. So those are the ones where you get like all of the spectrum. So I would say if you have trust issues, they're not for you. It is interesting because I think you make a good point. Like it depends on the person a lot. Like, because that's the way Lindsay and I are. Yeah. When I'm on a trip, we don't talk a ton. I remember when I was at the regional airline and I'd call her and be like, I'm in Columbus tonight. And she'd be like, I don't care. <laughs> what does it matter to me where you are? You know, like, are you safe? Like, uh, you know, like good check in. Thanks for the call. But like if it was a two to three minute conversation a day, maybe. I think what she said too was important was that it depends on the person your wife yeah. is in that like if they get one little idea in their head, they're going to like go off the deep end or if they can kind of insulate themselves from a lot of the flack and take what, take the good and look past the bad. Yeah. Because otherwise you could go down a really ugly rabbit hole with some of the stuff that she's read me. I'm like, whoa. Ken's give us an example of something valuable you've gotten from one of the groups. Okay, I'll give you two situations, like one that I personally find valuable and then one that I see a lot of value in. For example, our airline sends an email with some discount codes once a year. And if you don't do anything with it, it gets erased and it goes to the pilot's like airline email address, which they don't often check. So somebody posted on there and was like, hey, don't forget that the email is scheduled to be deleted tomorrow. And so if you haven't forwarded it or your husband hasn't screenshotted it, do that. And they asked Max and he's like, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't even know I ever got that email. So like situations like that. And that's an example of one of the like I say regional and I mean that by like physical geographic not a yeah. regional area. Yeah, geographic. Like that is a geographically specific group to our airline. Hmm. Another cool situation is a gal posts on there um, on behalf of another pilot in our geographical area whose daughter, 24, 25 years old, was just diagnosed with cancer and has, you know, less than a couple months to live. And she's like, she can't have flowers. She can't have this. She can't have that. But I would love if we could just send her love through filling her room with balloons. She loves balloons. So one woman was like, hey, I'm collecting Venmo donations and I'm going to get a bunch of balloons and physically take them over there. And another one was like, hey, here's their address. You can send them balloons. So it's cool to know that you have like that community. They posted a follow up picture, like thousands of thousands of balloons, like filling their entire house. So that's kind of just one of those like feel good. You have a community that, you know, maybe you don't know personally, but hey, you're a Phoenix captain, or hey, you're a Phoenix FO. Like, you know, those are our people. Well, I think it's good too. We've talked about this on previous episodes where it's it's important to have some sort of sense of community when you show up in a new city. without mm -hmm. knowing. And I think we also heard previously, like a lot of the military wives, they kind of stick together. Yeah. So if you're one of those gals or whatever, some sort of similar situation, it's like, honey, I got the job at Delta. We're moving yeah. to Atlanta. And like, you don't know anybody in Atlanta. Right. And then it, it's really valuable, I think, for that to have a sense of just community. Like, hey, where do I 
go shopping for whatever or just, you know, yeah. the mm-hmm. basics. It's just a way to relate. Here's a, a good example. And it just like is such a small world that there is a, a large group for an airline. It's like all of the wives. And somebody came in and posted and said, hey, my husband's considering a move to the airline. But we've been military our whole lives. I'm not sure it's going to work with our family. It's this specific airline. Does anybody have any information on it or an opinion? And so I screenshot it and sent it to Matt. I'm like, hey, can I offer up your information or whatever episode that was transitioning to the airline, blah, 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 on the podcast? And he's like, yeah, totally cool. And so they, Max chatted with her husband, her and I still talk on almost a daily basis, just like, hey, you know, what are you doing for insurance or what about this? Or like, how are things going with your husband's schedule this month? Or what's your Christmas schedule? I mean, you really do make good friends that understand what you're going through. But in the long and short of it, I think some of the group are very valuable, like your airline specific, geographically specific. The larger one, there's even one called the Pilot Wives Ramp and Raves. Ooh. I would steer Ooh. clear of that one. <laughs> that one is a lot of drama. Can we get Joel to join that one? And then he can maybe clip a couple. We'll just read maybe one. Every few oh, I'll go undercover. I'm yeah. totally yeah. down for that. <laughs> when we don't have a pilot story, we'll just throw one yeah. of those in at the end. We'll just have Joel start some fires there. It'll be great. That's exactly what our listeners want to hear is other pilots' wives complaining ranting about and raving. ranting and raving. Yeah. Now, let good. me tell you, the juice is good. <laughs> I'm going to start my own column. No, please don't. Yeah. Stay. <laughs> okay. Basically, our answer to the listener is it depends. Depends on the personality of the person joining the group. There's helpful information. Set some boundaries. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay, maybe like for our airline and for our geographic area. Yeah, maybe not 14. Maybe not pilot wives rants and raves and why my pilot is terrible yeah. husband group and all that. Stay out of that one. I can honestly say I've only ever made two comments in all 14 groups. So although I'm a part of 14, I'm not active in any of them. We have a good friend from our airline and his wife is very active in all of them. Most of the reason that I see the post come up is because she is commenting on them all the time and she really enjoys it. It's commenting is not for me, but. Okay. Well, Mm -hmm. honey, I appreciate you coming on the show. We better let you get back to constantly monitoring the pulse of the uh, pilot wives community. We don't want to take away from that. So she's about to post in rants and raves right now. My husband and these stupid microphones every five minutes. And yeah, who's even listening to the show? Complaining about the echo of my... <laughs> and now I have to go pick the kids up from school because he's busy podcasting, <laughs> you know. All right. Thank you, Kens. Always. Okay. Max, for this episode, I thought it'd be good to just take a little look back at 2022. What a year. Huh. And then uh, a look at 2023 and what it's going to be like to be a professional pilot. In 2023. Uh, hold on. <laughs> Let me get my crystal ball yeah, out. Because... I don't know the future, but uh, yeah. So let's start close to home here. End of 2022, as we alluded to earlier in the show, was a little rocky for the airlines. One airline Oof. in particular had a, a, a tough time. The holiday meltdown. You got to participate in it a little bit. Just a little bit. I was very lucky compared to a lot of people. I still made it home for Christmas. Yeah. I bid reserve, back to reserve to get christmas off and the schedule that i wanted and i escaped most of it i ended up going out on a turn that my flight got canceled on christmas eve and, I, and then they I ended up ferrying an airplane back and so I, I made it home and it wasn't bad for me i think a lot of our other crew members and passengers might say different so so these things happen in the industry right it's funny when you go on Twitter and on social media, people are like, this is it. It's over for Southwest. <laughs> They're going out of business. How could they do this? Every airline's had these problems in the past, well, right? Well, everyone's had problems, whether it's Southwest disappointed a lot of passengers and right around Christmas time. That yeah. was not good. There's no, there's no yeah. way to, to cut that. But nobody died. All the other airlines, I'm not saying that Southwest is special. It is what it is, but they've crashed airplanes. People yeah. have died. Like, there's been a lot worse problems in the airlines, and the airlines survived that. So, thank yeah. God it wasn't anything truly right tragic. So, we're talking about the largest domestic carrier of people in this country. Yeah. <laughs> it's the worst possible time, but so much in aviation, there has to be that really acute pain point before there's change. Sure. Right? Yeah. And there's been many things written online about, oh, you know, the computer systems were out of date and other things. And hopefully that 
really brings it to the forefront to get. Oh, it's yeah, the forefront is in like the national news and yeah. headlines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So now everybody's looking, and I'm sure there will be some change that results in yeah it for the better. Like I said, it could have been a lot worse. Yeah. It wasn't that bad. It's interesting when you think about like the job situation right now. Uh, do you think that anyone looked at that and was like, I'm not going to apply at Southwest because of that? I'm sure there was. I mean, yeah. I'm sure there's people. There's always yeah. somebody. Here's what I'll say. It was interesting because if you looked at the reaction of the public in the time, people were mad. Yeah. And if you looked at like Twitter comments or no, Instagram, yeah. things were just... And now, if you look at them now, where after the, the storm has passed, people are like, oh, we love you. We'll still support you. Like the bulk of the really? comments, yeah, now are like that. And when I was flying after that settled and we were, you know, everything's running yeah. out of time, <laughs> kind of back to normal. I mean, people were like... Oh, we're sticking with you. Don't worry. You know, like all these oh, encouragement. Yeah, I didn't get any hate on the road. Wow. It was all encouragement. Like, I was in the bathroom washing my hands in Denver, and some elderly gentleman comes behind and pats me in the back. He goes, We love Southwest. We're sticking with you. And I was like, Thank you. So, was he touching you while you were peeing? No, it was while I was washing okay. my hands. So, right. it wasn't quite as weird. <laughs> yeah. I love you specifically. He just looked over and said, Nice. By the way, <laughs> We're sticking with you. Yeah, we're sticking with you. <laughs> <laughs> I bet your wife is. No, just kidding. <laughs> Marker. <laughs> okay. That certainly want to recognize the pain and suffering. Yeah, many, it was def- many passengers. It was had memorable. To go yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it was, was awful for a lot of people. It, it was awful for a lot of people. Yeah, everywhere. Almost myself. Yeah, because I was like panic mode. Like, uh, I remember I bid this whole thing. You had to this artfully off, and now I wasn't gonna be able to get home. There was yeah. like no way. So. Christmas in Kansas City. Whew. Along those lines, I think another hot topic that you kind of educated me a little bit about this. The 737 MAX kind of was under the radar, I thought. You remember in 2019 when this was like the biggest story and we were like reading those I don't articles know how you missed this, dude, because it was been in the headlines. Like, yeah, I know, but quite I, I kind of did. So fill me in. What's going on with the 737 MAX? So there was a law that was passed as a result of the MAX crashes that said, look, anything certified in it was, I think it was like December 27th after there, but basically anything yeah. after 2022 would have to have an ICAST system, no more like enunciators and stuff like is in the 737. Right. Well, then it became apparent that not only the Max 7, which they thought was going to be certified, no problem in 2022, wasn't going to make the deadline and the Max 10 for sure wasn't going to make it. And so if they had to update to comply with the new law, then it would not have met the certification standard for the same type rating. Right. So then you would have had a different type rating for the Max 7 and Max 10, which obviously is a major issue for airline customers. See, you had to explain this to me because I, it's been so long since I've been in the cockpit of 737. I thought the new glass panel ones had ICAS. No. It's like an enunciator. Yeah. With like bulbs. It's hard to explain. That. Yeah. I was just saying this the other day that brand new airplanes they delivered still have all incandescent bulbs in the cockpit. Like all the capsules and stuff like that. They Are do. you allowed to replace them or do you have yeah. to... No, there's like a whole spare bulb kit. It's a whole thing. That's insane that there's no ISA. So yeah. anyways. So there's not. It's an enunciator type system. Okay. There's an enunciator that brings your attention to see what light is on in the overhead panel or whatever, right? It might say ELEC, E-L-E-C, that comes up with a master caution, and then it, that directs you to go look at the electrical panel, and then there's a capsule that lit up, says generator off or whatever. Oh, you know, you see what I okay. Mean? So you do have some electronic display on the screen. No. This is in a backlit enunciator type thing. Then it was coming up on that date, and Boeing says, well, we're not going to do it then. We're not going to make those airplanes if it's going to require a different type rating. Right. And so so it was the whole thing. So anyway, they tagged it on to the other big bill at the very end of the year, and they got the extension on the 7 and Max 10. So the 7 and Max 10 will be made as planned, same type rating. Yes. And they also tagged a couple other things in that that. This extension? was the big spending bill. At the yeah, end. it was yeah. the big spending bill. It was attached to that. And so there was the extension for the certification of those two types. Yeah. But also, they have to have a method of disconnecting the stick shaker. So if it's yeah, erroneous. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then also a way to monitor the AOA that will have to be also retrofitted to all existing MAX aircraft at Boeing's expense. But I'm sure the sales of the thousands of orders that they already have for these other airplanes make up for the wow. cost. Yeah. So Okay. So the Max 7 and 10 will be the last 737 models. Yeah. Dude, who knows? Yeah. Whenever you say the final word in aviation yeah. is just setting yourself up to look like an idiot. So I will never say that. Okay. Sticking with Boeing. This was hilarious. We were going through this the other day, 
And as you know, my nine-year-old son is super into airplanes. And we were talking about the 747, you and I were. And then, uh, let's see, we were talking about how many were built. Because the last one rolled off the line, right? Right. Yeah, just recently. And we were like, okay, we looked up like, okay, how many were built? And then I remember you being like, well, when did it enter service? My nine-year-old from the couch, he goes, 1970. He knows the date that airplanes entered service more than anything. It just, and then they always ask me. Like, that's the day. They always want to know, when did this aircraft enter service? Like, and I already don't know a ton about aviation history, as our listeners will know. But, like, entering service dates, I'm like, maybe give you the decade. <laughs> but he's talking about, like, I know. flying boats. That entered service in 1942. Yeah. We're like, what? It's unbelievable. That's kids. Yeah. So, shout out to the last 747. Yeah, last 74. That's the end of an era. I would say. It's kind of sad. Like, that airplane is awesome. There's probably a zero chance you'll fly one, right? It's pretty low yeah. probability. Oh, yeah. I would say never say never, Yeah, but very unlikely. I've never even been on one. Really? Yeah. That's the, I'll tell you, at Oshkosh when I was there, that 747-800 with the new motors and stuff. Oh, yeah. UPS had one there. That thing was sick. Never say never. Maybe yeah. I will. So I guess they just buy 777 freighters now? I guess. Because some of those 777s are big. Like those things yeah, like hold like 500 yeah. some people now. Yeah. So I don't know. Hey, if any of our listeners flew the 747, I'd love to hear about it. Shoot us an email. I'd love to hear about some of the flies for like Kalita or Atlas. I've always heard yes. they just do those like round the world trips, right? Yeah. We haven't talked to somebody. Yeah. That needs to be in the like, what's it like series that we do. That would be a good one. Yeah. Well, that's another thing. We all hear, but yeah. no one ever knows like really like what the deal is. Yeah. Unless you've done it. Exactly. So. I remember like talking to a guy and he's like, yeah, when we'd like go into Kabul, Afghanistan and like during the war and then. But they do, they just you, bounce. You, Maybe I have talked to somebody, but a long time ago. And, so, and they do, they just bounce from place to place to place. It's crazy. Yeah. Speaking of uh, during the war, uh, the next thing I think that happened this year, obviously, is the Ukrainian war and the impact that's had on aviation. I think that was one thing that we kind of started to see the trickle down. You were telling me about this. Airbus 350 situation they're in? I was just kind of wild because that's like kind of the latest and greatest, right? Aeroflot had taken delivery of one like just a couple of weeks before these sanctions came down the line. And it's just crazy. They have these like brand new airplanes and tons of airplanes that they have no way to get parts for. Right. Like you can't get anything. So what do you do? Like they're cannibalizing airplanes and, and like new airplanes to keep their fleet going. Right. But then the thing is they have all these international Long haul airplanes, and the only place they fly internationally right now is to Belarus. Shout out Belarus. <laughs> so it's like, dude, and people have written down lessors that have airplanes oh. there. They've already written them off like billions. That, I mean, that's a crazy thing. There are Russian airliners like the Sukhoi Superjet and other yeah, airplanes, but, but even that doesn't really solve the problem, right? Well, no, because they're all made with Western components, like the brakes or the avion. You know, there's yeah, always something, yeah. It's very hard. Like, if you get sanctioned, like, cut off like they are to yeah. get, like, high-end microchips and stuff. Like, the Russians and the Chinese, they've always been very good at copying stuff, but yeah. that's up to a limit. Not everybody can make everything. Like, yeah. the jet engine technology and the parts for that. And I always am searching for news because I'm like, how are they making this work? Yeah. And then I think all of us in aviation, doesn't matter if you're in the airlines or in business aviation, we all experienced the fuel prices going up this year. Especially if you're in business aviation and you created a budget for 2022 in fuel, you might have hit double what you thought. Yeah, because that's always such a uh, swag when yeah, you're yeah. building a budget. It's, you're it's just a like, guess oh, anyways, well, I mean, we'll just pick this number. I just remember uh, when I'd go fly out in Joel's neck of the woods, we land at these airports. You fuel would be over eight bucks a gallon, jet A. That used to be like, oh, we're going to Boston. Oh, we're going to pay, you know, eight, yeah. nine bucks a gallon. No, that was like all over. I don't know. Joel, I think you're starting a good time now getting back your student pilot's license because last yeah. year would have been brutal. <laughs> Can we lock that in? Can we lock that in? Is that yeah, yeah. You lock in your votes. And then uh, the other sad news about the Ukrainian war, we had to pour one out for the N-225. Oh, what a tragedy. I'm going to link this YouTube video my kids and I watched. They had this whole like documentary of them moving this huge piece of equipment. Did you watch that? I think it was from no. like Brazil to somewhere else. But they follow the crew and the whole process of really? what they do to like, like to see when they land and then they have to like construct the ramp to wheel this thing in. And I mean, 
It's not like the ramp just folds out like on a C5 and off you go. Yeah, they it's have. Like, oh no, I have. Yeah. It's like shims basically. Yeah, they it's have, like yeah. shims. So the ramp will support all the weight of this massive thing. Yeah, yeah. and the pilots are exactly what you'd think of as like Russian cargo pilots. <laughs> they look exactly like that. These like wrinkled flight suits and smoking cigarettes on the ramp. It was perfect. Yeah, that was really interesting. Have you seen it? There's flashes yeah. that are from there, but so it's destroyed. Sadly, I think most it is. And there, but here. there is a, another partially completed one yeah. in the hangar, but. I think the cost to complete yeah. it is massive, so unlikely that it will ever be done, but you never know. You and I also don't really have to deal with this much flying mostly domestic stuff, but obviously the airspace closures over there I'm yeah, sure have impacted a, a lot deal. of people. So anyway, that was another big uh highlight in aviation in twenty twenty two. Oh, the mask mandate lifting in April. That was a big deal for a lot of people. That was hard. Not so much for the pilots, really. I had a lot of sympathy for the flight tents having to be like oh, the mask the police. police. That's just because the mask thing is so. It's an unwinnable quagmire. It is. And some people have such strong opinions on it either way. It's like, it's become almost like a political. It was getting crazy. Of course, we went spring break to Hawaii last year and, you know, back and forth on those long flights with little kids and wearing the mask. And, you know, it was kind of a struggle. And then they listed the mandate like a week later. I remember. Perfect. But I think that was one thing in business aviation. We just avoided a lot of that. You had to live that. No, well, I was out most of the time. I remember on that extended leave program for most of it, just the tail end of it, I think, that I... Well, no, I was there for a good, like, four months of it. Of, like, wearing the mask mm-hmm. in the terminal. Yeah, and, yeah, the whole thing. You always just seem to slide right on through, Max. There's a reason Max has a nickname around here called Easy Money. <laughs> Another item that happened in 2022 was the the... JetBlue Spirit Frontier Saga. Yeah. Uh, remember Frontier That's trying pretty to wild. Uh, acquire Spirit? We had a, a listener write in about like seniority list mergers and what that was going to look like. And so I guess the question is, do you think there's more coming consolidation? God, maybe. I don't know. I, you know, Alaska's sitting out there. Frontier's still probably looking for something. Let me ask you this. If you just had to guess... Let's say the big four, United, Delta, American, and Southwest. Do you think they acquire a carrier in 2023? My guess would have to be no, but I'll tell you where things could get really interesting. And I don't know if it'll actually come to this, but yeah. acquisition's always been to like grab big market share, right? And expand right. quickly with, with airplanes and people yeah, versus an organic expansion, right? Like just buying airplanes and hiring people and this whole thing where... I think a lot of times it seemed like the thing that usually became the roadblock first was airplanes, right? You can just get airplanes out of right. thin air. Like you, you, there's order books and the whole thing where it could flip to being a move to acquire pilots. Right. Because that's usually what happens in a merger is then all they keep is the staff at the end of the day, it seems like. I remember because I was working at you know, American, American Eagle and the, the whole TWA acquisition. And it always just seemed like, oh, we're going to buy this new airline. And then they end up selling all the old planes and just to keep the people, it seemed like. So maybe yeah, they'll go back to doing that again. Who knows? Who knows? That was the one thing back when we were just getting started out. There were so many more carriers back then. So there was always a rumor about these guys are buying these guys, you know? And now there's just so many fewer there's carriers. Left. There's yeah, nobody left. Gonna... So it's like, there's less of that, like, oh, I hope these guys buy these guys. So, I don't know, interesting. Speaking of exciting acquisitions, the supersonic airliner will not die. It's got to happen one day. I, it's kind of like going to Mars. Like one day it will happen. But boy, does it seem like such an uphill battle. And it's funny because you look at it and you're like, well, they made the Concorde so long ago. And that was like in passenger service. Yeah. But then if you actually look at the numbers, it's kind of like the AN-225. The only way that works is with a state sponsor because that was never profitable. Yeah. If you looked in the expense to develop something like that. And so... I think that that's the same thing they're up against now. And Okay, so United, American, and Virgin all announced they had orders with Boom Supersonic. Mm-hmm. Boom, they don't have a prototype at this point that I'm aware of. They're targeting a test flight in 2026, certification in 2029. Let's... Which has already been pushed back. Yeah. It's supposed to be 23 and 26, yeah. I think. Joel, let's play a little over-under game with the three of us. I'm going to say over-under of June... 2030 for certification. Max, what do you think? Oh, over. We're over. Sure. Here's the thing. So the most recent news on this was they're like, okay, Rolls-Royce 
has pulled out as the engine provider. Remember, Rolls Royce was the motor that was in the Concorde, right? Yeah. Rolls Royce has built engines for supersonic airplanes, you know, yeah. like fighter jets and a lot of other stuff, right? I would have confidence that with enough yeah. money, Rolls Royce could develop an, a suitable engine, right? Yeah. Well, Rolls Royce pulled us out. And it had to have been a business decision, like for money. Sure. I, I would have to assume, right? But they did announce they've replaced them with Kratos Defense and Security Solutions. Home security? Which they built some engines for drone. Okay. And like cruise missiles and stuff. Hmm. So they can build a jet engine, but... Okay. They also went on to say, where I was reading, is that GE, Honeywell, Safran all have no plans to develop a supersonic engine for civilian flight. Hmm. So that right there raises another That's eyebrow. A... You're like, hmm. Okay. So you're going to go over. Joel, what do you think? Over, under... June of 2030. I don't think it'll ever happen. Ooh. Well, I just think oh, way over. I will say way over, way over. He's because taking way over. To this point, since Concord went bye bye, if you haven't had sort of a capitalistic reason to do it up to this point, and no one's really pushing boom to do it super fast, I question if it will ever happen. I agree. And the thing, too, is that again, if this was a profitable endeavor, wouldn't Airbus or Boeing be on this? Like, Boeing is announced publicly. They have no plans for a clean sheet airplane until there's another massive increase in engine efficiency. Like, there has to be a substantial right. increase. And I think that would be related to what the market would be, right? Like, no one's going to spend all this money for a modest increase in whatever speed, right. efficiency, until it's substantial, which this would be a substantial increase, but the market just can't be that big. And I think what they say, too, is that like civil engine makers invest billions of dollars that they recoup over the lifetime through aftermarket sales of engine development, right? And that's yeah. on a standard airliner where there's thousands and thousands, where you're talking about su supersonic you know, airliners, just not that much to spread the cost out. And the other thing that I read in our research for this is Pratt & Whitney is estimated to spend $10 billion to develop its latest engine to re-enter the civil market after a gap of several years. Ten billion dollars for that, and that's just for a conventional for a conventional engine. Again, I will never say never, yeah. but this just seems like a really steep road to climb. Joel Cross boom supersonic off the list of potential sponsors for twenty twenty three. They hadn't responded to my email yet. Yeah, so. yeah, okay, good. I will also take the over on this. I felt to me like a publicity stunt when all the airlines oh, were signing for up sure. for these. Yeah, yeah. It was oh yeah, they have free. the mock up yeah. United. Yeah, yeah. yeah, come on. It's, it's, just, it's great publicity. Yeah. All right. Last thing for 2022. What was your favorite pilot social media moment? Do you have any? When I was thinking about this, I was trying to think back when, when was the old jump out of the airplane moment? And that was in late December of 2021. So it just missed the cutoff. Remind us what that was. Jump out the airplane. Uh, hey, my airplane's going down. I better ditch. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forget yeah, the, the guy's YouTuber name. guy. Remember? Oh, that he guy? He bought that oh, airplane. Yeah, yeah, that is a good yeah. one. Yeah. That's so right. That was late 2021. It sort of was in the... Oh, yeah. Can't get it that started. That was my favorite exception moments for that. Yeah, of pretty. all time. The memes definitely oh, went yeah. into 2022, so... Yeah. Okay. We'll allow that. I'll make a ruling. That's like a whole yeah. category at that point, though. And he ended up getting like an FAA... Yeah, he got... He got his hand slapped, maybe a certificate taken away. Yeah. No, yeah, it was something serious. How about you? I don't know. I reached out to our meme experts, Roy and Jeff. They sent me the post of, this was in 2021 also, so I don't know if it counts, but there was a uh, certain high-profile member of a pilot Facebook group that had flew around with some gear pins in. He was highly critical of all of the pilots. Uh, highly critical. Dead or alive. Yeah. Like ones that crash. He's just pretty awful. Anyways, he took off and flew around with some gear pins, but then the memes were like... Pretty pretty hot in 2021. But then someone has created this meme account where like once a week, it's called Terry the Fat Shark. And he like comes and brings you something. Sometime in 2022, he re-delivered the gear pins. It just stoked the fire again. And that was my favorite meme. That must have been hilarious. Yeah. So I think that's a good wrap of 2022. Turbulent year there. But I mean, for the most part, like you heard our conversation with James a couple episodes ago, an incredible year Ooh. for pilot hiring. And... uh now, I think this is what we should do. Let's try to predict the future for 2023. Let's take a pause from the show to talk about our friend Timothy P. Pope. When it comes to financial planning, he's got your back so you can focus on the mission ahead. 
Timothy P. Pope is a certified financial planner helping professional pilots design and execute smart financial planning strategies. From retirement planning and investment management to military transition and tax planning, he's your financial planning partner. Timothy P. Pope, certified financial planner helping professional pilots make the most out of life. Let's talk about what the landscape we see for 2023. What's it going to be like to be a pilot in some of these different sectors? And uh, I don't know what we expect or what predictions we have. So if we start with the airlines, sounds like all cylinders are firing in the hiring departments for the foreseeable future, except for FedEx, which we heard they've actually stopped yeah, hiring. Yeah, which is, who knows? Yeah. Maybe that's... So is that canary in the coal mine? They're in a very different business than a yeah. lot of other operators of airplanes. So maybe in the yep. cargo sector, yes, that could be the, the yep. canary in the coal mine, as you say. But boy, at least if you look at the airlines, just the staggering amount of retirements that are yes. set to take place, like even and like James said, even with an economic pullback, yep. if there's zero growth, there's still tons of hiring that has to take place. Just even if the airline contracts some, like they yeah. still would have to hire to, re- to replace the amount of people that they're going to be losing. So just in your experience from the train department at your airline, it feels like they're kind of spooled up at this point, right? Mm-hmm. They've kind of got it yeah, down to yeah, where yeah. they're able to handle the big number that are coming in in every class. Yeah. I do think that if you want to work at the airlines this year, you'll continue to have choice of yep. where you want to go. I think so. Things are still happening pretty quick. Let me ask you this. If you were in Joel's shoes as a student pilot right now, thinking, I'm going to become a professional pilot, do you think it's too late? No. Do you think you've missed this particular wave? I don't think so because the amount of time from being a student pilot to being an airline pilot yeah. has been substantially reduced if you want to fast track it. Yeah. So the answer is no to your question. Okay. What have you seen out there, Joel? As a student pilot, I mean, is it hard to find instructors still? What have you seen? In my area, yes, really hard to find instructors. A lot of guys that put out their information, but don't return phone calls. Maybe that's not just because they're busy. Maybe they've just heard about me. I don't know. Just kidding. They have now. Parker, <laughs> just very, very busy, the groups out there that are doing it. And, uh, you know, a lot less open stuff at small airports. Everything is sort of consolidated to the larger, the little regional airports around the area. So you go there. Yeah, sure. They have a group of three, four, five instructors or whatever. But like you were saying, Max, those groups have transitioned to sort of fast track training, whether it's, uh, you know, multi-engine ratings or otherwise. So you've got folks flying in there for a two week fast track class and preferred training over there. And they're able to do that fast. So I see that happening a lot in that area. Not wrong by any means, but it's just uh, for a guy just trying to get his private pilot license or something like that. It does make it a little bit more challenging. Well, it also it trickled down too, because I don't think this is a big rush on training, but at least at the airport I have a hangar at. The hangar weight used to be about six months, and then there was like shaded tie downs mm-hmm. that were usually available pretty immediately, and then there was open tie downs that were readily available. Right? Yeah. Well, that regular hangar is over two years. There's a weight for covered tie down and a weight for open tie down. Mm-hmm. That was part of the COVID people buying boats and stuff and airplanes and all that. But I'm sure that's probably also put a drive on training just for flight reviews and and yeah. checkouts and all that kind of stuff too. Aviation is just firing on all cylinders right now. But the other thing we're seeing on the flight training front, too, is the return of the foreign students. They're starting to get those contracts signed again. Yeah, I heard that. And, That's coming. And so at the Deer Valley Airport, which is where you have your plane, that place used to be insanely busy with foreign student training, and then it completely disappeared for COVID. That's so nice. Um, so it's going to be be interesting to see. So that will tax the system even more for us. Yeah. I agree with you, Joel. If I'm just the businessman or the person that just wants to do a lesson or two once a week, especially those part 61 schools. Yeah. But I still say that, you know, with this time is different with the hiring boom because of the attrition due to retirement and everything else. I still say that it could turn around 180 degrees like that. Yeah. Because it has. It has many times times. before. Yeah. And I think it's more resilient, but still. Yeah. I mean, no matter how thick the armor. Right. <laughs> so let's talk about what it's going to be like to be in business aviation this year. Boy, I mean, I think that's still going to be strong, driven by what we just talked about at yeah. the airlines. It just seems like you hear a lot more that people in business aviation go to the airlines versus the opposite. 
Right. It does happen, but that's the general flow of pilots. And just with the draw because of retirements and expansion that are still happening and the, and how gangbusters is going, it's still going to, you need to draw a lot of corporate pilots. So that market is going to be strong for yeah. either getting a better job, re- renegotiating your current position to something better yep, or getting into corporate aviation from somewhere else. Yeah. Definitely think this is the year of if you're in the city you're in, it, you want to be in and you had to take a job maybe that was okay to be there. This is the year of a lot of people upgrading to a good job in the city they live yeah, in, you know, kind sure. of that second level of the hierarchy of need of corporate pilots, I yeah. guess. Or renegotiating yeah. your job to be better. That can be a tough nut to crack. Again, like we mentioned before, we pulled people at an NBAA uh, symposium and they said, would you rather get a 30% pay raise or hire an additional pilot for your flight department? And overwhelmingly, everybody said, hire that extra pilot. So yeah. the folks that I've talked to that are weighing the difference, it's like, well, I could go to the airline, work more, make more money. But the appeal to staying in business aviation is if you find that lower paying, but higher quality of life. The balance is working for the airline is that you may fly more yeah, and you'll make more money, but you certainly have a lot more control of your schedule generally. Right. And then the problem with business aviation is, as we both have experienced so many times over, is you'll sit there and you'll do nothing for weeks and weeks. And then you plan one thing. Buy one ticket to a concert. And that's when the, yeah, that's when the trip comes. It just never fails. Two pilots, one jet. Jet's going to fly. You got to be there. Yeah. And... So that's always been the tough, as far as quality of life, it's not just time off. Yeah. It's time off when you want time off. Yeah. And that's always the the tough part. That's the rub. So we'll continue to see, I imagine, pilots voting with their feet. Yeah. No better place to negotiate from than with a resignation letter, right? Yeah. Won't be able to get a raise until you uh, quit. Then all of a sudden it's, whoa, 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 hold on. on. Wait a minute. Yeah. And this is also, I would say, in business aviation you know, a lot of the gains can be made when you are taking a job from somebody that's leaving. Mm-hmm. Especially when they're leaving for the airlines. Yeah, exactly. Wait, so why are they leaving for the airlines? Well, <laughs> yeah, and then they lay it out. And that's just kind of been my experience too, is every time I've left a job, the next person has been able to get some gains. So I think this is something to consider. And again, can be difficult to negotiate if you are uncomfortable getting into these types of conversations Mm -hmm. with the boss. That's part of, I think, the characteristics of what makes a successful corporate pilot, right? Yep, for sure. Those are things you have people to do for you at the airlines. That's right, for better or worse. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So I think that's just kind of our general take on 2023. I think it's still going to be a pretty good year, and we'll see. I concur. We'll talk in 24 and see. Yeah. Uh, we'll revisit. Uh, Joel, make a note of the our predictions here, and we'll go back and revisit them. It'll be... <laughs> see if we eat our words. Yeah, exactly. The over-under game. And I can guarantee the supersonic jet. We're going to be right about that one. Anything else you want to cover in uh, 2023? Any crazy predictions? The whole thing has been crazy lately. Yeah. How about this? What are you most interested to see how it pans out? Mine is certainly the airline hiring numbers. I'm very curious to see at the end yeah. of 23, how many people actually got hired Versus the projections. I think along those lines, the thing I'm most curious about is will a major airline at least announce, maybe not fully integrate, but will like American take their wholly owns and just add them to their seniority list for their wholly owned commuter? Yeah. You're almost paying narrow body rates anyways. And then how many emails have we gotten? Well, I don't want to go work for these guys I because then I, think I can't it's, I think it's more complex than that, though. Yeah. But I'm just curious if that will actually happen. At least announced. Yeah. Not saying it's actually going to get done. Anything is but possible. That's it. Joel, you have anything? I have some predictions. Yeah. Oh, oh One of them perfect. Is, uh, oh, geez, go on, Joel. Go ahead. Continued awesome content from the 21.5 podcast. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a slam dunk now. I thought got this you was going to be another <laughs> bull semen story. Yeah. Now I'm disappointed. Now I don't. We'll see. No, but seriously, uh, do you guys have any wishes? You you know, you're talking about looking at the crystal ball, but what do you wish you could see in there? My wish is that all of the airlines that are in overdue contract negotiations get contracts in 23. That's not impossible. No, it's not because it's yeah, everyone's close and just somebody's getting ready to go, you know? And then, yeah. then, it's, then I think the chips will fall pretty quick. But. My wish for business aviation is that we would be 
able to remove some of the silos that are in place for flight departments in instead of everybody having to go through and learn the hard lessons individually, there would be more shared learning. What are you talking about? So I'm talking about a couple different things. One, it, when we talk about pilot hiring, so-and-so leaves and then the flight department, the owner or the, the principal or the company has to learn this hard lesson about what the pilot market's like. And then another flight department doesn't make a change because they haven't experienced it themselves, right? And then so it's like this thing where it's like it's a very siloed experience for everybody. So everyone has to learn the hard lessons. It is, but I think to an extent it's not because all of these people are talking about it at the country club, right? That's And all complaining about all their first world problems. Well, my pilot left and I, you know, yeah. I had to pay this and this and that. And they talk, you know, owners of that airplanes. That is becoming people, more of a conversation. So it like, is. And I think they hear it from one or two yeah. people. They're like, oh, my, he's not going to leave. And then all of a sudden he hears it three or four or five. He's like, wait a minute, Mike. Exactly. <laughs> if I don't do and something. That, and that's what I'm saying. And there's no trade association that's going to fix that. And there's no, you know, it, it, it really is. It'd be the same as if you called me and you're like, my landscaper quit. Yeah, and another buddy called this. Yeah, and exactly. And, and, and I think that we're at reaching that critical yes. mass where it's happened enough times now. People are yes. like, oh, you know, nobody's immune. So that's my wish is that, you know, because it's one thing to hear that from your pilots, right? It's completely different when you hear it from somebody else. It's interesting because you've seen all these big pay raises at yeah. the regionals, right? That's yep. been very in the headlines. And you see the coming pay raises, I think, for the major airlines. But you've seen pay raises and pay rates certainly come up for yes. business aviation, but I don't think it's been as staggering. So I'll be interested to see if the majors all of a sudden it's in the headlines hmm. every couple months, United, Delta, Southwest, American, as the dominoes fall on those, if that gives more momentum in the business aviation side, because then you're just seeing big numbers at the regionals, yeah, big numbers at the majors, and then all of a sudden it's like... The, at the end of the day, Ken Casey made this point on our first podcast. He goes, for business aviation, needs to be a good experience for the people that are in it, the owners. Mm -hmm. And if they lose enough pilots, they're just going to say, forget it. I'm doing net jets or I'm going to go and get a fractional card or, or whatever. Again, the other thing we talked about that we're starting to do a case study of is if the economics of having your own pilots, ultimately pilots could get so expensive that the economics, it does not pencil to have your own pilots. Right. You'll have to share them with everybody else, which means sharing an airplane, which means a quarter share, you know, yeah. net jets or whatever that might yeah. be. But there's only so much of the budget that the pilots can command. That, yeah. Like we said, a great example is like a beach jet. It requires right. two pilots. It's it costs this much to operate. Like yeah. if the pilots are 75% of the budget, like what it just what are we it doing? just doesn't pencil. Yeah. yeah. So my wish is that we will have some of those fights will be fought for us in 2023. Yeah. The other thing too, you have to keep in mind is with all of this stuff, it's like when it comes back around, Yeah. ultimately it's like, you don't want to also negotiate, negotiate yourself out of a, a career or a job later on. But yeah, I don't know. FedEx parking some airplanes though. I think that we haven't heard anything like that in a while. Let's just yeah. say that. I don't know what it means. I don't know trying to predict anything, but we haven't heard anybody that flies yeah. large airliners say, we're stopping hiring and parking airplanes. We haven't heard that since yeah. COVID. So hmm. that's all I'm saying. Eyebrow say. raised. That's all I'm saying. Eyebrow raised. Well, we'd love to hear our listener predictions for 2023. If you got a good one, shoot it in. And if you're right, we'll send you a stone carving. <laughs> Dude. Wait, Joel, how long does it take you to yeah. do a stone carving? Ugh. Like, I'm sure it depends on how intricate, like, just, you know, a right. medium difficulty stone carving. What does that take? Hmm. I did one thing that the other day that was one letter and it was a few inches high and that took about two hours. So, so 21, five okay. flexibility yeah. is the key to, uh, okay. This could be a while. I'll cut yeah. you a deal. Yeah. <laughs> Might not be okay. a good deal, but I'll cut you a deal. All right. To wrap up story time, I thought we'd tell, do something a little different. These may not well, sort of be aviation related, but I, you and I are both avid Craigslisters, let's say buying, selling, trading. I wanted to tell a few stories about our Craigslist experiences. And I wanted you to start off last year. Tell them about my Christmas gift that you got for me. Well, Dylan's always talking about like the commuter vest. He's a vest Big guy. Vest and guy. I think that's hilarious. And so I went on Craigslist and there was this aviator's leather vest. And it really wasn't... But it had nothing to do with aviation. It had nothing to do with aviation, but 
I went with my kids down to like, it ended up, I negotiated the deal and I went to this like, I mean, really awful trailer park, like in yeah. a bad part of town. And my kids were like, oh my God. But it's another, I like driving my kids to like kind of sketchy parts of town. So they yeah. like have some oh, who know, does contrast. It? Yeah. Well, duh. well Joel's so, a new father here. Take notes, yeah, Joel. Joel. Yeah. Write this down. And uh, so, no, so we went there and we, we negotiated the deal with the guy and, and we picked it up at this awful trailer park. I, mean, I don't know. That was about it. Right. And then you packaged it up and it still smells. So you wore it. I did wear it. <laughs> I actually wore it recently to like a costume party. Yeah. For Halloween. Yeah. So very short shorts too. Yeah. It's very it's, offensive. Yeah. It was great. So God, you've taught me so much about Craigslist over the years. I remember when I first moved to Phoenix and you were like acquiring, I can't even remember what it was, but I went with you. I learned so much on this Craigslist deal. You had just gotten this BMW. Was it a 325, I think? I don't remember. Yeah. And I can't remember. We were going to buy like a 40 or $50 item. And we go it, park in this neighborhood and you're like, if you're going to try and negotiate a discount and you're driving a car like this, park around the block. Don't park in front of their house. So we like parked off to the side and then like walk up to this lady's. Around the corner. Yeah. You just got to be yeah. around the corner. Get around the corner. And just you got to keep a low profile. And then the other lesson you taught me, which is really good, is you strategically place money in different pockets. Right. So that if you're like trying to negotiate a deal, you're not just pulling a huge wad of cash and then, oh, yeah, you always had 30. And then you're like counting yeah. out, you know. <laughs> so Max put like a 20 in one pocket, a 20 in another pocket. I can't even remember what we were buying. It was something like Dude, 20 or 30 bucks. Do you remember the most epic Craigslist technique of all time, though, is if you live in a big city, yeah. invariably something you're going to buy, it's going to be far away. It's right. going to be. So I would always. <laughs> I, I shouldn't give this one away, but this, this is, is so yeah, great. Maybe, maybe hold this one. No, nah, it's too late. So if somebody lives way on the other side of town, right, and you pick somewhere that's from the opposite from where they are from you that's on yeah. the complete opposite side of town, and you tell them you live there, and you'd really like to buy this item, but it's just so far to drive. Would you be willing to meet me halfway? I'm like, you know, Scottsdale's like halfway. Like, how about we meet off the Frankway Ride right in 101, which is like two minutes from my house. <laughs> so you have them drive that's but you're doing them a favor. Yeah, to meet you, and you're like, oh, thanks, man. That oh, was that, I can't imagine driving the whole way. Could you? Yeah, that would have been awful. That would have been terrible. <laughs> yeah, we might have to shout out to your boy Chris. That, I think that might have been his move originally, right? Oh, uh, maybe. It was, was it for him? A, it's a group technique. So, Joel, I'll tell you this story. This is kind of I get two good Craigslist stories. One, we had a bunch of Embry Riddle guys hanging out at uh, our buddy Chuck's house one night and Chuck had this like lawn furniture oh, yeah. he was trying to get rid of. And we we're all just hanging out in the back patio with like nothing really going on. And I said, let's make this a game. And so what we did is we took a picture of this patio furniture, which was decent patio furniture that he just needed to get rid of. And we put it on the free th section of Craigslist. And in the body of the ad, we said, here's the address. The first person to come gets it. And no phone calls, no free. contact information. Free, Craig free. Uh, Craigslist free. Just come pick it up. Whole and then we all bet on when the person would come to claim it. So we all had like 10 minute increments with money down. On this. It was the most entertaining night. And the guy that showed up was like exactly who you'd picture coming to pick up yeah. free Craigslist that was awesome. lawn equipment. What about this? So another use of Craigslist that was pretty bad was we were having a poker game with all of our buddies and our one buddy a few months before previous or whatever it was for halloween he had been michael phelps and he's oh, yeah. he's in pretty good shape and so we, we had this photo that i don't know where we'd gotten we were at the party or whatever i had a photo of him in like a swimmer's like little bikini thing with no shirt on you know or whatever standing oh, yeah. there we went to this poker party and i posted his photo and made a fake ad on craigslist that like he was looking for a good time and blah oh, blah, no. blah blah and so we hit we posted it right as the poker game started <laughs> And then you see his phone start ringing. And he's like, what? No. And hangs up. And then like a couple of minutes later, it's ringing again. He keeps silencing it. I'm like, just answer it, dude. He's like, what? And he's like looking at his phone. And it was all these. We put like some really dirty <laughs> stuff. And it was so uh, Why so, is anyone friends with us anymore? I don't even know. No, I mean, I let a couple cats out of the bag there, but whatever. Last one. So these little boom arms for our microphones. We needed one of these for our studio. And someone down the street was selling one on Craigslist was 70 bucks, just to give you an idea of the value of the item, because it kind of is relevant to the story. So I said, hey, I will meet down at this bank. He goes, we would need to meet in a bank parking lot. 
I'm like, okay, you know. So we meet at this bank parking lot. It's just me. This guy rolls with five other dudes. They all get out and they're kind of like in this show of force. These guys are all in high school. And I think they thought they were going to get ripped off by me buying a $70 microphone boom arm. And so he gets the boom arm out. And he's like, you got the cash. You know, let me see it. You know, bring it out. He's got all these 17-year-old guys standing around with their arms crossed. I'm like, it's yeah, usually, here's the money. It's, it's a microphone. It's the other way yeah. around. Right. If I'm the one bringing cash to the deal yeah. is where I'm worried about yeah. getting ripped off. Because you know somebody's showing up. You know how yeah. much money they have. No. Like, they were but worried. these guys were, were you going to roll in? I'm just going to roll a, in, a hit them all over the head, boom mic? and take a road boom mic for $70. <laughs> and so he called every kid at the local high school to come down. I need and, some you know, backup, guys. Yeah. You got a deal going. So down. I just kind of looked at him like, all right, guys, you know, like, so. Uh, you look pretty intimidating. I do. I do. So That's true. Maybe he looked you up on the Facebook. I guess. Yeah. Joel, do you have any Craigslist experiences? During college, I had six different bicycles stolen from me just at various times. Hard to believe. But I, only one was actually one I brought. And so, you know, you get one stolen, you just log into Craigslist, you find another, maybe better. So it was slowly oh. improving. And then, okay. yeah. But I, I do recall I had a friend that was also out a bicycle after it was stolen on the streets of Columbus. Go Buckeyes. And uh, there they, you know, they went and met the person in the parking lot. I don't know if this is a true story or not, but they said, hey, can we take this for a test ride real quick? Guy said, oh, yeah, go ahead. And it was their stolen bicycle. And so they just oh <laughs> went off pedaling, kept they on just, going. Genius. Kept yeah, on going. That's pretty good. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the table's ah. a turn. Well, see, listen, everybody's learned a little something on this episode, for better or worse. Just keep all that cash in different pockets. Park your BMW around the corner. Uh, the best is, would you meet me halfway? Don't steal that one. Now everyone's going to do it to uh-uh. Yeah. That's so good. It's uh, it's face now. It's all Facebook Marketplace, anyways. I'd say, yeah, Facebook Marketplaces. Yeah. It's better. Okay, that's it for story time. Well, hey, twenty twenty three, Joel. Welcome to the show. We're yeah. glad to have you. He's going to uh, definitely exude some positive influence yes. on the program. I know I was being silly earlier, but really great to be here with you guys. And like I told you, you know, in that job interview, you guys have such a good thing going on that uh, it'll be fun just to come on, try not to get in the way, and just add to uh, this awesome listener base that you guys have. You guys just continue on to do what you do. All right. Well, we appreciate it, Joel. We appreciate our listeners. We appreciate all of the feedback and reviews that folks are leaving. We appreciate our sponsors, too. Absolutely. Did bankroll this whole operation. Advanced Air Crew Academy, aircrewacademy.com, Harvey Watt for all of the pilot insurance needs. And Timothy P. Pope. Appreciate you, Tim. More to come. In uh, 2023, Max, we're excited to see what happens in aviation. And the key to navigating an uncertain future is to remember. Flexibility. Joel. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Flexibility is the key to air power, guys. There we there go. There Nailed it. it. All right. We'll see you next time. The statements made in this show are our own opinions and do not reflect, nor were they under any direction from any of our employers.